our goal as legislators should be to build a better and a more prosperous state for not only our troops that are coming back home, but certainly for all Oklahomans. And I'm happy to say over the last year, we have done well on that front. The progress we have made in Oklahoma comes despite facing tremendous uh, difficult circum circumstances. You know, I was thinking back just a year ago today, we were starting to climb out of a recession that cost Oklahoma nearly 80,000 jobs. Like people all around the country, many Oklahomans were struggling. Jobs had disappeared in the wake of the financial crisis that was largely out of our control. Tax revenues were down, and the state was facing a budget deficit of over $500 million with only $2 left in our rainy day savings account. So it was against that very difficult backdrop that I ask you, as our legislators, to do three things with me, to work on three things. First was to pass measures that would create jobs that would jumpstart our economy by building the very best economic climate possible for our state. And secondly, to reduce government waste and to make government more efficient, more effective, and more uh, smarter in all the services that it delivers. And finally, I asked the legislature to work with me to strengthen education and to pass education measures that would boost student performance and have accountability. And I'm proud to say that we all worked together and we all rose to that challenge making 2011 one of our most productive legislative sessions in history. <laughs> to reduce job-killing legal fees, we passed sweeping lawsuit reform that put a cap of $350,000 on non-economic damages. <laughs> we delivered the largest rewrite in our state's history of our workers' compensation system, improving it to be fair, and also to help the injured workers and also the employers reduce their costs. And that action has already helped boast our state and its economy and our business climate by lowering workers' compensation costs to Oklahoma and Oklahoma businesses by $30 million. And that number, by the way, will continue to rise as we further implement those reforms this year. And businesses appreciate that. Now, while many other states were raising their taxes, to close their budget gaps, and we're driving out jobs, by the way, out of their states, we cut our income tax. And because of that, Oklahoma will be able to give an extra $116 million of money back to uh, the people of Oklahoma. It's their hard-earned money back to them to help our working families and also to spur economic growth in the private sector. These and other reforms have helped create a better business climate in Oklahoma that will lead us to more prosperity and more growth. And by the way, the numbers back it up. In 2011, the state of Oklahoma had a net increase of 41,600 jobs. Our job growth makes us rank third in the nation in job growth. We gained back over two-thirds the jobs we had lost with the most devastating economic downturn that we had faced with the recession. Our unemployment rate continues to be one of the lowest in the nation at 6.1 percent. And despite the drought that we had, Oklahoma agriculture exports are even up 70 percent in the last three quarters thanks to our farmers and the ranchers and the good work they did despite the drought that we had. Oklahoma also ranked first in the nation in growth and manufacturing jobs, which grew two and a half times faster than Texas. I got some o OU fans over there. And also five times faster than the national average. These gains are also reflected in our population growth. Whereas once our citizens of Oklahoma left to escape the Dust Bowl, we are now ranked eighth in the number of new residents that have moved to Oklahoma. In fact, the largest number of people who have moved here now comes from California, of all states. A complete reversal of the migratory patterns that were depicted in the Depression era and in the book In the Grapes of Wrath. We're now seeing them come back to our great state. 
All these factors demonstrate that Oklahoma's economy continues to outperform the national economy. People across the country are noticing, and Oklahoma, I believe, stands in testament to the fact that low taxes, limited government, fiscal discipline is a recipe for job creation. Now, our success stands in stark contrast to the record of a dysfunctional, failed policies, the outrageous spending that we see in Washington, D.C. In Oklahoma, we could teach Washington a lesson or two about fiscal policy, the role of government, and the proper size of government. And that's why I'm asking you to join me in sending our president and his allies a message this year in the form of a resolution declaring that Oklahoma will support a federal balanced budget amendment to the United States Constitution. <laughs> Washington is leading this country off a fiscal cliff. It's reckless, it's wrong, and it's destroying jobs, and it's holding back economic growth in all 50 states. And most importantly, it threatens the future of our children. Oklahoma needs to be a leader, and it needs to stand up and say this is wrong. And despite the missteps that we've seen in Washington, and we know in Oklahoma that 2011 has been a better year in our state. After a long, painful recession, our citizens are finding good jobs and are getting back to work. I realize, however, that there are many Oklahomans that are still looking for jobs, as well as businesses that are looking for skilled labor. That's why the Department of Com Commerce and I are pleased to announce the launch of a major online initiative called OKJobsMatch.com to match job seekers and students and employers and to help get people back to work and find the employees that our businesses need. And by the way, some of our most unique skill sets that are possessed uh, in Oklahoma are from our military, our men and women who are going to be returning from their service with the armed services. These men and women will deserve and should get our help in finding good paying jobs as they reenter the workforce. So the OKJobMatch.com okay OK will serve, I believe, as a comprehensive re-employment resource to help our returning military men and women who have bravely served us. So I would like to encourage both our employers in our state and those of any background that are looking for employment to help us populate this website with resumes and also even with job opportunities so that we can have a very valuable tool for job growth in our state. And as we continue to look at Oklahoma's impressive rate of job, job creation in the private sector, we also are going to have to continue to look for ways to eliminate waste in the public sector and to create a smaller, more efficient, and customer-friendly Oklahoma in our state government. As you know, last year we signed a law, we signed a law, we signed into law a series of government modernization measures designed to eliminate waste and save taxpayer dollars including one that consolidated several state government agencies under the Office of Finance. And it also instructed the Office of Finance to find 15% in expenditure savings. And I'm happy to report that not only did we meet that target, but we exceeded that target. And I want to commend our Secretary of Budget and Finance, Preston Dorflinger, and his team for realizing $4.2 million in savings in 2012 and delivering a more streamlined, customer-friendly approach to state government. Preston, thank you so much. <laughs> Additionally, the information technology modernization and consolidation measures passed by you, the legislature, are projected to save another $170 million over the next seven years by consolidating and modernizing our IT systems, another $170 million. So my thanks goes out to our Chief Information Officer, Alex Pettit, and the state agencies, by the way, who have worked very hard to update and modernize our IT systems. And I want to give you an example on that. Our Department of Education under Superintendent Janet Brisey 
have told me that the IT reforms that she has worked with, with our CIO, are expected to save dollars $600, $600, $600, in 2011 and are also projected to deliver another $3 million in savings over the next three years. That's a very specific example, Superintendent Barisi, of money that we are saving, money that we can put back towards important needs in education. So thank you for your cooperation and all your help on that. In her IT reform, they took phone lines, email systems, and their website, and they've all been upgraded, and they're now more responsive, they're transparent, and I believe they're customer friendly, so thank you for all that work. So now, because of our successes in our IT initiatives, I have asked higher education, and they have agreed to explore IT consolidation opportunities on their own, starting with the creation of a chief information officer for higher education. All these examples will show that we are able to eliminate waste, find more savings, more efficiency, and more opportunities to modernize our state government. And I think it's important to continuously improve and rethink how government solves its problems. For example, our criminal justice systems and our correction systems can illustrate that point very well. In 2011, I appreciated that the legislature and in particular, Speaker Still, joined me in supporting Smart on Crime initiatives. Together, we acted to increase our resources for substance abuse treatment centers that are less, effect less expensive, more effective alternatives to prison for nonviolent offenders with addiction issues. And I believe this year we can do more. My budget reflects a financial commitment to alternative sentencing for nonviolent offenders with substance abuse issues, as well as to the crisis centers that are located throughout the state by the Department of Mental Health. We can offer help and hope to Oklahomans who are struggling with addiction issues and other mental health issues. These initiatives are smart, they're effective at reducing repeat offenses and will save the state of Oklahoma money treating addicts and helping them to once again become productive Oklahomans, parents, and certainly taxpayers. Our goal as lawmakers and public service servants, regardless of what agency we are dealing with, is to achieve better results and better services. And one of the areas that we have identified as need of improvement last year was education. And that's why we pursued important measures last session designed to strengthen our schools, boost test scores, and ultimately deliver stronger and a better educated workforce. I want to commend the legislature for sending me a series of education reform bills, including grading schools, A through F, so the public knows how schools are performing, ending social promotion, and also measures to ensure that we had the most effective teachers in the classroom. The Department of Education is implementing these reforms and performance measurements initiatives designed to promote, as Superintendent Barisi will say, college, career, and citizen readiness. Those three C's are exactly what we should be promoting in Oklahoma, which is why I've partnered with higher education officials to launch Oklahoma's Complete College America initiative. Oklahoma must do a better job of encouraging Oklahomans to pursue higher levels of education and to complete, and to complete their degrees or get certificates from our career technology centers. We know that the majority of jobs that will be created in the next decade will require either a college degree or some type of career certificate from one of our career technology centers. Additionally, we also know that the average uh, college graduate will earn more than a million dollars than they would if they just had a high school degree. And that is why we have set a goal that we are going to increase the number of college graduates from 30,500 degrees to 50,900 degrees over the next several years. And Chancellor Johnson, thank you for all your work on this new initiative for Oklahoma. Well, as you can tell, I am proud of the accomplishments that we have had in such a short period of time, but there is more work to be done, and we're far from completion of all of our work. 
The people of Oklahoma expect us to continue moving the state forward and creating a more prosperous, better state. They expect our lawmakers to continue to find and eliminate waste in government and to make agencies run more efficiently and effectively. That's why in 2012, I'm asking the legislature to join me in focusing on initiatives that will create more jobs, encourage more efficiency in state government, improve our infrastructure, and continue to improve the quality of our workforce. Our first task, of course, is to create a budget that reflects those goals. And I'm happy and proud to say that our budget numbers for the next fiscal year are considerably better than what they were last year. Revenues are up 10% over initial estimates, and that's good news. But the state is also experiencing significant loss of one-time funds. A lot of the federal funds are not going to be there that we had uh, last year. In fact, the state has been left to find over $500 million in revenue to replace those lost funding sources. That means that most of our state agencies will be facing a flat budget moving into the fiscal year 2013. But it does not mean that we will accept the status quo and that funding as usual means business as usual. As a manager in the private sector, I used to tell my employees, you have to inspect what you expect. As governor, I expect efficiency and good stewardship of our taxpayer dollars. So this year, we're initiating a statewide performance evaluation initiative of all state agencies. Under current law, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Under current law, state agencies are required to submit a strategic plan that includes initiatives, their goals, and proposals for increased efficiency and improved services. But unfortunately, once we get these plans, they haven't always been scrutinized. Well, it's a new day in Oklahoma. And my office and the Office of Finance will begin to look at each and every one of these plans. We will use new software, new technologies, that will measure performance and efficiency to align expenditures with outcomes. <laughs> that analysis will help us right-size state government and ensure that each agency is operating as efficiently as possible. Improving state services isn't just a bullet point in my speech, it's a necessity. At the Department of Human Services, for instance, lives depend on that. Protecting the lives of our children and our most vulnerable citizens in our state has to be a priority. And that is why we're going to do everything we can to make sure that our systems are working. Now, I know there are many hardworking, dedicated employees at the Department of Human Services, and we all appreciate them. But we also know that when systems don't work, when they're ineffective, that that can lead to tragedy, and that's unacceptable. That is why I will work with the agency staff, our legislature, to reevaluate the systems, to ensure that we are allocating resources correctly and in a way that max maximizes the effectiveness of Department of Human Services. I want to thank outgoing Director Howard Hendrick for his service to the Department of Human Services. And I'm also confident that our new interim director, Terry White. Terry, thank you for stepping up to the challenge that will help lead the commission through the transition and also to help seek ways to improve services within that agency. Thank you, Terry, for stepping up for that goal. Moving forward, our goal for the Department of Human Services is that it should be the model for the nation in protecting children and protecting our citizens and our most vulnerable. In 
In order to improve services in other state areas, state government areas, you will notice that I have proposed several supplemental funding items. The first of these items focuses on public safety, which will always be a priority of mine. We must increase the number of troopers we have on the road. You like that? The current numbers are dangerously low due to attrition, retirements, and the lack of a patrol school since 2009. That cannot continue. Secondly, the state must keep its commitment to fund teachers' health care benefits. For that reason, I've included $37 million in supplemental funding in the measure for the Department of Education so we can keep that commitment. Our recent reform measures ask a lot of our teachers, and it's important that we uh, adequately fund their benefits and we keep our promises to them. Additionally, our state medical examiner's office, which has been underfunded and understaffed, requires additional personnel and equipment. And because of the positive changes that agency and the management has provided with our new chief med medical examiner, Dr. Eric Pfeiffer, I am asking for a supplemental to aid that agency. Cities and local municipalities need our help to recover from the extraordinary expenses that they have had from the natural disasters that occurred in Oklahoma last year. As you know, the state emergency fund is nearly empty and it has a large backlog of expenses. That's not right. So I'm asking you to work with me to refill the state emergency fund so we can help our local communities and municipalities. Now, in addition to all of these supplemental measures, my budget also adds additional funds to the Attorney General's office. As you know, the Choctaw and the Chickasaw Nations have sued the state of Oklahoma concerning the, uh, who owns the water in 22 counties. We continue to hope that this issue can be resolved through mediation without large legal fees and with all parties negotiating in good faith. In the event, however, that the tribes do not share this goal, we intend to defend the water rights of all Oklahomans against the claim that favors one group over the interests of the entire state and all of its citizens. So to ensure that we're adequately prepared to do that, the Attorney General needs additional funds to retain the very best counsel. Now, Now, these are not the only priorities that will require additional financial commitment. The state capitol building is currently in a state of despair. It's embarrassing for our citizens that we have barricades that are out front when people come to conduct their business here at the capitol. It's a bad image for the state, and I think it even affects our ability to recruit business. It is our responsibility to maintain this building which is a symbol of Oklahoma and its people, and that requires proper funding. We must pass a bond issue for capital repairs. The people of Oklahoma elected us to make responsible decisions. Let's do our job. The items I have listed represent commitments we need to make to adequately fund our state government and provide essential services, but that's just a start. 
Oklahomans also expect us to make tough decisions and to take bold steps to move Oklahoma forward. So today, I am asking our lawmakers to join me in an ambitious and exciting undertaking, the passage of a bold tax reform plan that will represent the most significant tax cut in Oklahoma's history. The Oklahoma Tax Reduction and Simplification Act will immediately cut income taxes for Oklahomans in all tax brackets. It will simplify the tax code and will chart a course forward towards the gradual elimination of our income tax. It will give Oklahoma the lowest income tax rate in our region, besides Texas, making us a more competitive state for job creation and retention. And over time, our income tax would be phased out for every Oklahoman. I believe our plan is a game changer for our state. It's a job creator. And it provides broad-based tax relief to the middle class without starving state government and without hurting the poor. It also protects core government services, and it would begin January 1st, 2013, by replacing our current system, which, by the way, taxes the first penny an Oklahoman makes, and it will reduce our current seven tax brackets to three lower and flatter rates. Now, let me give you some examples. Example, our, for example, a couple making zero to uh, 30,000 a year will now pay zero in taxes. Zero to 30,000 a year will now pay zero in income taxes. For those making 30 to 70,000 a year, the tax rate will be 2.5%. And for families making over 70,000 a year, the rate will be 3.5% as opposed to the 5.25% rate they are currently paying. Under these new rates, a middle class couple making $40,000 a year, for example, will pay 37% less in income taxes in 2013 with additional cuts to come in the future. These tax cuts would take place year one immediately. Moving forward, tax rates would be cut an additional quarter percent in any year in which the state of Oklahoma hits a revenue growth trigger of 5%. That growth trigger gives the state a safety net should we experience another major economic downturn. I want to commend Representative David Dank and Senator Mazie and the legislators and others who have worked so hard to re-examine our tax code and tax incentives. We all have a, a common goal, and that is to lessen the tax burden on Oklahoma families and to allow them to keep more of their hard-earned money. It's gonna be done in a responsible way. Now the question is, how do we pay for a tax cut? Under the Oklahoma Tax Reduction and Simplification Act, we'll do it in three ways. First, by eliminating tax loopholes, carve-outs, and other exceptions. Second, by continuing to eliminate government waste and making government more efficient and effective. We've already proven that we can find substantial savings through government modernization initiatives. And third, we're gonna capitalize on the economic growth we expect to see as a result of having a pro-jobs, pro-business tax reform agenda. Now, according to Americans for Prosperity, non-income tax states have seen a 59% economic growth over the past decade versus a 38% high income tax state. Additionally, job growth increased significantly, significantly in non-income tax states, job growth did, while high tax states have actually lost jobs. 
New jobs and increased investment in Oklahoma will lead to more revenue and increased collections of sales taxes, uh, corporate taxes, excise taxes, and, and other revenue sources. So with all that in, your mo in, in mind, I'm asking you to support the Oklahoma Tax Reduction and Simplification Act, which I believe will be the centerpiece of a conservative pro-jobs agenda. Send this bill to my desk, and we'll make sure Oklahomans get to keep more of their hard-earned money. Another way we can also boost Oklahoma's economy is supporting one of our most important industries, one that has helped lead us to greater economic prosperity during tough times, and that's the energy sector. Last November, I unveiled a comprehensive energy agenda called the Oklahoma First Energy Plan. My task force on economic development, or what I like to call my game changer committee, noted that a comprehensive energy plan is vital to sustaining economic growth in Oklahoma. The oil and gas industry and our companies support nearly 300,000 jobs in our state. Renewable energies like wind power are also growing at a fast pace. Energy in, in many ways is, is one of our backbones of our Oklahoma's economy. So we need policies that reflect that type of important truth. Now while many in Washington refuse to support the production of American-made energy, Oklahoma is leading the way towards energy independence and domestic energy production. And one area where we have tremendous potential is in natural gas. Natural gas is an abundant source of energy. It's efficient, it's affordable, it's clean, and it's produced right here in Oklahoma. There are, however, obstacles to its usage, mainly infrastructure and demand. It's kind of like a, a chicken and an egg uh, scenario. Consumers don't buy natural gas vehicles if there's only a limited number of places where they could put fuel in their vehicles. The private sector doesn't want to put fuel stations in if there's only a limited number of consumers who can um, use that service. So that's why we have launched in Oklahoma an unprecedented, bipartisan, multi-state initiative to break the cycle and to jump start both the development of CNG infrastructure and also the use of natural gas vehicles. So together, Governor John Hickenlooper, a Democrat of Colorado, and myself have asked other states to join us in this effort by committing to purchase natural gas vehicles for our state fleet vehicle system. And I'm happy to report I now have 10 states that have joined in signing a memorandum of understanding to endorse this concept. Thank you, Secretary Ming, for all your hard work on this. We believe that this commitment will provide incentives for American car manufacturers to begin producing an affordable natural gas vehicle. And by the middle of this year, we will submit a request for proposal to the automobile companies asking them to develop that product. By supporting natural gas consumption, we are supporting an Oklahoma energy source that I believe will continue to produce more jobs and help us grow our economy in our state. And this is only the first step in helping in a far-reaching energy agenda. Oklahoma can be and should be leading in implementing energy efficiency measures that will save hundreds of millions of dollars. So I'm asking our lawmakers to send me a bill that every state agency in higher education to reduce their energy consumption by 20% by the year 2020. Oklahoma State University has already been a leader in this, and they have already been able to save $19 million in savings in energy efficiency since the year 2007. If some of those same practices could be extended throughout state government and higher education, we expect to see a statewide savings of at least $300 million in 10 years. What a difference that would make to our budget. <laughs> oh.
Oklahoma has been a leader in energy production, but unfortunately we've lagged behind the rest of the nation when it comes to energy conservation. And guess who's footing the bill? Taxpayers. And that's unacceptable. And with the help of the legislature, we can address this problem and we can become a leader in energy efficiency. Next, I want to ask you to make a strong commitment to Oklahoma's transportation infrastructure. Having safe roads, a modern and functional bridge system is vital to commerce and also to job creation. But unfortunately, Oklahoma has been ranked at the top of the list of some of the worst bridges in the nation, and that's just not something I'm proud of. To address the problem, Secretary Ridley and I have proposed the Bridge Improvement and Turnpike Modernization Plan that will fix all 706 Oklahoma structurally deficient bridges on our state highway systems by the year 2019, moving Oklahoma forward from the worst bridges in the nation to the best bridges in the nation. Thank you, Secretary Ridley. I'm asking the legislature to help me with three goals that are outlined in this plan. First is, we are proposing to restore 15 million in the motor vehicle revenue fund back to the transportation budget that had previously been diverted to the general revenue fund. Second, I'm asking for your support in raising the cap of the roads fund in order to provide the resources to improve our road and bridge system. And third, in the transportation plan, we're planning to repurpose 1,500 steel beams that are currently in the I-40 crosstown, which will come down because we've opened the new crosstown, and help us construct 300 new county bridges. <laughs> To further aid in this project, the plan also includes an additional $20 million a year for construction for our county bridges. And lastly, our plan also relieves congestion on the creek and the Kilpatrick Turnpikes, two of Oklahoma's most widely traveled roads, without raising taxes or tolls. The Turnpike Authority has already actually begun work on this project. Now, while we're improving the health of our transportation system, it's also important that we improve the health of Oklahoma and our citizens. Healthy living is important, not just because we want Oklahomans to enjoy a full and productive life, but because unhealthy choices also hurts not only the person's health, it hurts our economy, it's a drain on taxpayer dollars, and it also drives up the costs that our state government spends on health care. Oklahoma is currently ranked 48th in the nation in health indicator at outcomes, and that is unacceptable. Now, there are several major factors that hurt our health rankings. Obesity, diabetes, tobacco, poor nutrition, infant mortality, substance abuse, lack of physical exercise, just to name a few. It's time to address these numbers and take them in the right direction and take control of our own destiny. So to do that, I have signed an executive order that will prohibit tobacco on all state property. Thank you, Secretary Klein, for all your work on this. Now, I'm not finished. We're also going to close the smoking room in the Capitol. You'll like this one, too. And we're going to transform it into a fitness center. You 
guys, go get your workout shoes. Now to fund this transformation, the state has already applied for a grant from the Tobacco Endowment Trust Fund, which will also be matched by the Oklahoma Hospital Association, who has generously agreed to put more funds to match that. So they'll be paying for this fitness center that we will have. Secondly, my budget uses financial rewards to encourage schools to serve nutritious foods and promote physical activity. Third, we are proposing additional funds to enhance our statewide infant mortality prevention program. Infant mortality rates in Oklahoma can and must be improved. Fourth, 64 of our 77 counties in Oklahoma have a shortage of health care professionals, especially rural physicians. That must change. To remedy that, I have included $3 million to establish 40 new doctor residency slots to help increase the number of primary physicians in rural and underserved Oklahoma. And lastly, I'm asking the legislature to pass a bill that will reduce liability to schools so that moms and dads and others from the local communities can join their children in accessing school facilities, tracks, basketball courts, and exercise equipment. And that is a part of an effort led by the Fit Kids Coalition and the American Heart Association to open schools and their exercise facilities to the public by giving me a, a limited liability bill for our public school systems and, and public facilities. All of these initiatives will help Oklahomans make better choices about their health and to get moving in the right direction. And just like we are asking our citizens to make good decisions about their lifestyles, they've also asked us to make good decisions for Oklahoma here at the state capitol. So today I've outlined a path forward to what I believe will be a more prosperous, better, and brighter future for the citizens of our state. We can do that by allowing Oklahomans to keep more of their hard-earned money, by improving our schools and strengthening our workforce, by investing in our transportation infrastructure, by being more energy efficient, by improving our health, and by ensuring that we eliminate government waste and that we build a government that is more efficient and more effective. And that is my vision for the state of Oklahoma. I hope that there are those of you in the room that will share with me on these goals. I'm excited to be able to present this agenda to you and to watch the hard work of the legislature in another year as we continue to move Oklahoma forward to keep our momentum going and most importantly to serve our citizens. Thank you for all that you do. May God bless you and may God bless the state of Oklahoma.